So when we go into the private breakout groups though, that is not recorded. So kind of my primary teaching for the first hour is recorded. And then we come back after the breakout groups and people kind of share a little bit, that's recorded. But everything that goes on in the private breakout groups, that's private. And so your confidentiality will be respected. Uh, we uh, usually start with a meditation. Um, and so I'm gonna lead the meditation today. And the meditation is also gonna help us prepare for the topic today. It's gonna help us to prepare for what we're gonna be working with. Um, Anuprabha, I have a favor to ask you. I'm gonna make you the co-host. And while I'm doing the um, meditation so I can drop in, if you could just notice if people come in and they haven't muted, if you'd be willing to mute people. Would you be willing to do that, Anuprabha? Yeah, definitely. Thank you very much. All right. You might so, want to mention, oh, Scott, you might want to mention to the new people about the chat box, too. Uh, oh. That they could chat. Oh, yes, exactly. Thank you. Chat. Yeah, thank you very much. And yeah, I'm not saying that. You know what? I guess I don't need this. Um, so we have a wonderful chat box for any of you that are new. I'm just opening it up right now. And um, this is a, a way to connect with each other. Um, and we use this a lot. Uh, I'm going to ask people at times to fill in, uh, you know, the chat box. And if you're on a computer, your chat box is at the bottom and a little bit, usually it's a little bit to the left. Um, and so I want to invite everybody maybe to, you know, put in your name and where you are, what uh, part of the world you're in. And um, that's always kind of fun. Uh, so let's do that for a moment. And on a problem, do me a favor, give me a, a sound check for a moment. Can you say something to me, please? Check one, two, one, two. Good. One, two. Okay, cool. Okay, All right. So I also want to invite people that you're going to probably want to take some notes. It's also nice if you, you know, turn off your cell phones uh, and really drop in and focus because we're going to be giving you some powerful tools to, ama to manage the hard stuff in life, managing our emotional pain. And we're also going to touch on how to support others when their emotional pain is alive, when you're dealing with somebody and their emotional pain is alive. So it's going to be an important class. And um, uh, I love seeing we've got people from Indiana and Arizona and Manchester, New Hampshire and Santa Monica, California, Maui, Hawaii. I always kind of enjoy seeing all the people from all over that are joining us. So thank you, everybody. Welcome. All right. So we are going to drop now into our meditation. I want to invite people to probably get into a comfortable position and get relaxed and unless you're operating a motor vehicle, <laughs> let's close our eyes and let's start with the breath. Taking deep, deep breaths. And as we breathe deeply, we calm our nervous system. And with our eyes closed and breathing deeply, we begin to leave the external world, the influence of the external world. Deep, deep breath. And tuning into our bodies. How are our bodies informing us? As you close your eyes, as you breathe, what do you notice? How well resourced are you? Did you get enough rest? Have you had enough to eat? Do you need water? Are you stressed? 
some of us experience a consistent low-grade anxiety. Some people, there might be something really big going on in your life that's really scary. Financial, health, relationship. And sometimes when there's an ongoing challenge, it's like a big black cloud hovering above us. And some of us might be in good spirits, excited, happy to be in the class. Whatever you're feeling is absolutely welcome. In Love Coach Academy, all emotions are welcome. There's no good or bad emotions, but some are comfortable and some are uncomfortable. Also, just noticing, is there any places in your body where there might be some tension? What's going on inside your body? What is your body letting you know? Just let's all give thanks to our beautiful body temples. How grateful. Really, I invite us to all be grateful for the, the gift of the body temple the gift of the senses, the gift that we can all be here from all over the world, tuning in, learning together, practicing together, growing together. How blessed we are. For the final part of this meditation, I want each of you to remember a recent time that you were in emotional pain meaning that you were having feelings that were very uncomfortable. Perhaps you were really angry, maybe even raging, or perhaps you were really scared, or maybe you were really emotionally hurt by the actions of another person. So just remembering what that felt like, what was going on for you, and remembering that moment. And we're gonna work with that moment a little bit today. So I invite everybody to get clear on what that moment is. And when you've got that moment in mind, just raise your hand and open your eyes. And then you gotta kind of track how you're all doing. For those of you with your uh, computer video turned off, maybe uh, turn your cameras back on, if you're willing. And again, if you've got, if you just turned a camera on and you've got the emotional situation in mind, just raise your hand. Great. Okay, thank you. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. So, I want to just start by asking maybe one of our love coaches um, to share what came up for them. And I'm going to actually work with you a little bit as a demonstration for the others to also work with it. So, um, which love coaches, I'll pick one, but which love coaches would be willing to share uh, a situation? Uh, all right, uh, Candace. Yeah. 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 Hi. Hello. Hi, Candace. We can hear you, and the spotlight's on you. Okay. Oh, jeez. Um. Overwhelming sense of emotional incapacities and deep insecurity, um, uh, self doubt, and lack of faith. I would say, sums it up, even that's a lot. <laughs> yeah, okay, so. And exactly yeah. what you said, it being like a cloud, like a filter. <laughs> 
And remember to keep breathing as we talk. And um, maybe, uh, Sean, if you could adjust the computer just so that it's a little closer and we can hear her um, the best I possible. Can add more too. Mm -hmm. and for Is those, that better? That's great. Thank you. Well, I think it's better. I don't. Um, and for those of you who don't know Candace, uh, Candace has recently gone blind. Uh, it's a degenerative, degenerative. So Candace, describe a little bit more the emotional pain that you were in touch with that came up for you. Ooh. A feeling like a failure. Um broken uh, like as much as I desire and intend to be all that I want to be and do because dot to dot to dot to dot I'm not that's not that can't happen for me so, so I'm just gonna go slow here so notice when I asked about emotional pain what Candace shared with us very vulnerably were actually thoughts triggering the pain. The thought that she's broken. Right? The thought that there's something fundamentally wrong with her. Those are thoughts which are triggering the emotional pain. The actual emotional pain would be sensations in the body and feelings. You did mention it earlier, feeling overwhelmed. Um, I'm guessing maybe feeling contracted. Would that be accurate? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, getting really small and uh, turtling, what I call like just uh, diminishing myself. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, on an emotional level, um, how it shows up in my life is a uh, stagnancy, you know, because uh, I'm going to mess it up, so I'm just not going to do anything. So first of all, thank you so much for being willing to share so vulnerably and already mm -hmm. people are mentioning the chat box, how they're relating to you and how valuable this is. So thank you. So as a teaching point, right, first step in managing our emotional pain, what are the thoughts that we're having that are triggering our emotional pain. Now, we're gonna talk about the reptile brain for a moment. We're gonna come back to you in a moment, Candace. Um, but we all have this reptile brain. I have my little reptile brain toy here that I often utilize. And the thing about our reptile brain, it's the oldest part of our body. It was formed immediately after conception. And the entire brain stem and body is built around this. By the time we're an adult, the reptile brain is about the size of a walnut. It's in the back part of the brain. And it has only one function, and that is survival, to keep us in survival. When we perceive the possibility of attack, not attack itself, the possibility of attack, the reptile brain ticks over and we choose fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. Now, this is really important for managing our emotional pain because those four things that happen, fight, flight, and flight, normally we don't have to run away from animals trying to eat us now. Uh, flight usually shows up as disassociation and disconnection. Oh. Freezing, we're kind of frozen like a deer in the headlights. Fawn is people pleasing, uh, or you could even say ass kissing. Fawn is like, you know, the small dog, when a big dog chases and goes out to small dog, the small dog goes on its back and exposes its neck, saying, okay, I give up. You can kill me, please don't. Those are the four things we can do. One of the things that is really important to know is almost all emotional pain is triggered by our own thoughts. I really want you to take that in, almost all emotional pain is triggered by our own thoughts. We're pretty blessed. We're not living 
in a situation very often where we truly are in physical danger. It's pretty rare that we're in physical danger. When we're in physical danger, let your reptile brain take over. <laughs> Absolutely. But when we are emotionally involved, when we're running these thoughts, it triggers us. So going back to Candace for a moment, her thoughts of I'm broken, I'm not good enough, I can't do this, triggers probably a combination of flight and disassociation and freeze. Anytime we're running a guilt or a shame thought, we're probably triggering our own reptile brain. As I said, a combination of freeze or a combination of you know, those things. And again, I just reminded, please keep yourselves muted. Thanks. Um, and so in Candace's case, and this is very common, shame almost always triggers paralysis, okay? Because what happens is when we're running guilt or shame, it triggers this kind of freeze, disassociated flight, kind of a combination of freeze and flight. And we don't want to continue because we're afraid we're gonna mess it up or we're not good enough, which then creates overwhelm, which then creates paralysis. Does it make sense to everybody? If you can relate to that, please raise your hand. I think almost everybody is raising their hand. Who in, the, I'm not gonna call on anybody right now, but just out of curiosity, who runs guilt? Who experiences guilt in their life? Okay, almost everybody raising their hand. Here's a really important thing to remember about guilt. First of all, if you raised your hand for acknowledging you feel guilty, I wanna say thank you you're not a sociopath. If you didn't raise your hand, we're not so sure. <laughs> That's a bit of a joke, but not really, because if we're experiencing guilt, it's because we care. A sociopath is dangerous, and obviously none of you are sociopaths. A sociopath is dangerous because they don't experience guilt. They, and that's what makes them dangerous. So guilt is not a bad thing, but, Guilt can create paralysis. Guilt can create shame, paralysis, and freeze. And the ironic thing is the people that feel guilty tend to be the people who care the most. Underneath your guilt is your care. You didn't meet your value for care at the level you wanted to, and so you feel guilty. You feel guilty that you haven't called your mother more often because you care about your mother. You feel guilty about the way you snapped at a family member because you care about that family member. You feel guilty because you didn't get your work done because you care about that work. If you didn't care, you wouldn't feel guilty. So when the guilt monster comes up, acknowledge it and don't stay there, drop into the beauty of your care. The beauty of your care. So that's a very important step of managing our emotions. First thing is, what is it I'm telling myself? What am I telling myself that's triggering my feeling? I'm telling myself I'm broken, therefore I feel paralyzed. I feel contracted. I'm telling myself that I'm a bad person because I don't call my mother enough. Okay, that's a thought, it's a story. Your mom doesn't think you're a bad person. I mean, some mothers lay a guilt trip, but they, no mother really thinks their child is bad. Um, and there's none of the mothers of any of you. So, you know, we have to stop and notice, what are, my, what are my thoughts? What are the thoughts that are triggering me? And then recognize, we begin to see this loop, you know, I'm broken, I'm not good enough, shame, paralysis, and then we're not showing up in our full passionate dynamic self, and it becomes a uh, self-fulfilling prophecy. We then start collecting evidence to support our negative belief about ourselves. right? Who can relate to that? 
a kind of misery go round. So, um, uh, let's all twinkle Candace for giving us a really beautiful example to work with. Thank you. And you just got a lot of twinkling. Um, so I wanna open it up. I'm gonna take the spotlight off myself here. I wanna open it up to any thoughts, questions, or reflections. And we'll start with uh, one of our senior love coaches, Adrian. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Scott. Um, Scott, you mentioned that the majority of our emotional pain comes from our thoughts. And I'm curious, would you also divine, um, define, say, the emotional pain that comes from losing a loved one to death, for example, or say a, um, a lover decides to leave you? Would you describe that kind of emotional pain also being the byproduct of thoughts? And then a second um, question is, um, what kind of emotional pain, I'm curious what the answer, and depending on that answer, what kind of emotional pain would you say is not the byproduct of our thoughts, the stories we're telling ourselves? Thank you. Um, well, I'll start with the first one, how to manage loss of a loved one. And I have a pretty significant amount of personal experience with that. I walked my father through his death when I was 23. Um, I lived with my mother during the last six weeks of her life when she was in hospice. And uh, most dramatically, um, I held my wife when she died. Um, I was with her as she died. And she was very young. She was only 52. Um, so, and I miss my mom and I miss my dad and I miss my wife still very much. What comes to mind is balance. It is valuable to mourn. It's absolutely valuable to mourn. And that's actually when I made the list of four things to manage emotional pain. One of the things is to acknowledge the pain fully. Allow yourself, if there are tears, weep. If there's anger, pound a pillow. Don't pound a person, but pound a pillow or do jumping jacks or go for a run. It is important for us to move the pain through our body, not to stuff it. Because if we stuff it, we'll either then explode or have a heart attack or have a stroke or it'll come out sideways. So it is really important for us to, to acknowledge when there's emotional pain, really cry, really get angry, really allow yourself to move it. And usually sound and movement helps us to move it out of our body. And so, yeah, if there's a, a big hurt, if there's a big pain, you cry, do weep. It's, it's important, it's valuable. But then there's how we imagine it, okay? So anytime, in fact, you know what? I'll take you all through a practice with this. I'd like to invite everybody to remember a time that you had a painful breakup with somebody, okay? A painful breakup. Everyone pick a time when you had a painful breakup with someone. Hurts, it hurts. How many of you ran the story that somehow you were either abandoned, rejected, or not good enough? Who ran that story? Okay. Most of us. How perfectly human. For those of you new, that's our motto in Love Coach Academy. How perfectly human. We're spiritual beings, but we're having a human experience. All right, so the thought is I wasn't good enough. He rejected me. She abandoned me. That's a thought. It's an interpretation. But as you think about that relationship that ended. Let me ask you a question. Would it be accurate to say that that person was not capable or willing to love you the way you wanted to be loved? They weren't capable or willing to love you the way you loved you. That's true. Raise your hand. Okay. So that's a very different thought that's much more accurate. Now it's still painful. 
that they weren't capable or willing to love you the way you wanted. But probably the way you wanted to be loved actually is beautiful. It speaks to your values. It speaks to who you are, or at least who you were at that time, and the way you wanted to be loved. But if your thought about it is there's something wrong with me, or even if you go into a lot of blame and judgment, there's something wrong with the other person, that's toxic. It's toxic to believe that we were abandoned or rejected. It's toxic to believe there's something fundamentally wrong with me and that I'm broken. It's toxic to believe that there's actually even something fundamentally wrong with another person. No, they just weren't capable or willing to love you the way you wanted. And the way you wanted to be loved is beautiful. It's beautiful. It's sad. But don't add to the sadness a story that can keep you in paralysis. Because when we, as we saw with Candace, when we have a story, I'm rejectable, I get abandoned, men always leave me, women don't love me, I'm not attractive enough, I'm not fill in the blank enough. That story keeps us um, in a state of consciousness and then we're gonna collect evidence to support that experience. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. Yeah. So that's, we can't control, ultimately, I couldn't control my wife dying. We can't control the people who, who our relationships end with. But we can control the story we make up about it and how we think about it. And honestly, when I, in terms of mourning the death of a loved one, what I found is really valuable is the word bittersweet. My wife died quite a while ago, it was eight years ago. I still miss her terribly. It's bitter that she's gone. It's bitter that I miss her, but it's sweet because I still have so much love for her. If I didn't care, it wouldn't be, it, there wouldn't be that sadness, right? Um, and, and I have a good life, I'm blessed. I, I'm not stuck because she's gone but I still miss her. It's a bittersweet experience. One of the other, I'm getting to the four ones pretty quickly. One of the other four is this, all emotional pain that lingers is in direct proportion to the love that you're missing. I'm gonna say that again. All emotional pain that lingers is in direct proportion to the love that you're missing. We have an event, you know, that happens. You get into a big argument with somebody that you love. While it's happening, it's happening. But then when it's over, it's how you remember it that maintains the emotional pain and charge. And to the degree that we are thinking about it a lot and feeling it over and over and over, is the degree that we have love for that person that we're missing. Again, it's because we care. If we don't care, it doesn't matter. Did that answer your questions effectively, Adrian? I guess there's one last piece of, um, you know, what, what emotional pain in the way you kind of understand it is kind of defined by most emotional pain is created by our own thoughts. So I really, really resonate um, so much with could you describe an emotional pain in your experience that's not a byproduct of the, the stories we're telling ourselves or our thoughts? I imagine maybe chemical is one. Um, mm -hmm. Depression, for example, that's a byproduct of, of chemistry. Yeah. I wonder if there's anything else that comes to mind. Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, and I'm really glad that Adrian brought up, you know, chemistry. When, for those of us that are love coaches, when we're working with a client and they have depression, we need to find out to what degree do you believe talking to a client, that it's chemical, and to what degree is it a reaction to your environment? As love coaches, we are not qualified to help people with the chemical part of it. They've got to go to a, to a doctor, to a psychiatrist for that. But we can help them when it's a reaction to their environment. And most of the time, it's a combination, to be honest. So yeah, there is absolutely chemical 
stuff that goes on. I think also, to be honest, there's a form of emotional pain that is when we are influenced either by our ancestral lineage or by what's going on in the overall collective. Um, I'm guessing that most, maybe all of you, are highly empathic and you not only have your feelings, but you process the pain of your children or your roommates or your lover. Some of you are processing the pain of your ancestral lineage. Some of you are processing the pain of the world. I would imagine there was emotional pain that any of us who watched the horror of Floyd George's death, we were having emotional pain based on what we were watching it. Now you could say that it was still our interpretation, but as human beings, watching a, help, a, a human being gasping for breath for eight minutes until he dies was one of the most horrific things any of us have ever watched. And that of course created tremendous emotional pain. The, the anger, the, the helplessness, his helplessness, and then we feel helpless because you want to jump in and make it better, and we couldn't. So there's definitely emotional pain connected to what we watch. Um, certainly mothers and fathers, I think have a lot of emotional pain connected to their care for their children, you know? Um, and obviously, we, anybody we care for, we have emotional pain connected to that. Um, now again, there is that point, a point where what we think about it then keeps us there. So we have, let's just use the Floyd, who watched the Floyd George video? Okay, so almost all of us, so that's a good one to work with. So I watched it once, once was enough for me. Um, Scott, um, I really need, it's, it's George Floyd. <laughs> Thank you. So me. we really need to remember his name correctly. I'm sorry to thank correct you. you. No, thank <laughs> you for correcting me. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, so, but how we think about the George Floyd video, how we think about that is up to us. And what we do with it is up to us, right? So anyway, um, Thank you, Scott. Yes, that feels clearly well answered. And what you're pointing to is super powerful. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Mariko, for correcting me. Um, other thoughts, questions, or reflections that have come up for anybody about this? Uh, Maya, I'm unmuting you. Okay. Okay. Yes, thoughts come up for me about. Um, missing uh, my ex-husband, Bondino, And you brought up a point I hadn't thought about before where it's um, bittersweet. I just, I don't know, I've just never put those together before. I've always thought how sad it was and tragic, like why did it happen, you know? But I never combined, I never brought in the sweetness. Yeah. And I think it would be good to do that, but I, 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 I don't know. Maybe I'm just not feeling the sweetness. I'm not quite sure. Well, so thank you. First of all, let's all twinkle Maya. Thank, thank you for you. sharing that. That's vulnerable. Um, we find the sweetness by remembering the moments of love, right? After all these years, you wouldn't be missing him if there weren't experiences you had with him that were precious, right? Again, lo long-term emotional pain is connected to the love that we're missing, right? I miss my mother, I miss my father, I miss my wife because there was beautiful love shared with my mother and my father and my wife. And so we, we can go into gratitude for what we shared. I'm so grateful for the years that I did have with each of them. I'm so grateful for the love that was shared. And this is, this is a really important part of managing emotional pain because it is important to acknowledge the uncomfortable feelings, 
but sometimes it's human nature to stay so focused on the deficiency that now we're constantly living in a constant focus on the deficiency. Constant focus on the deficiency. And then we become obsessed with the deficiency. And then in that obsession, we get too locked into our shame story or our blame story, right? And so pull back, look at the big picture and remember, wow, I'm missing this person because of the experiences of love we shared or companionship or sexual intimacy or quality communication or whatever it was. And then if we can remember what the qualities were, right? Go a little bit beyond that person, but remember the qualities, then we go, wow, I really enjoy sexual expression. I really enjoyed playing chess. I really enjoyed going to the movies. I really enjoyed reading a book together, whatever it was. We go back and remember the experiences we had and are those experiences we still wanna to have today and then are there ways we can have those experiences in present time, given our current circumstances? So it takes us out of the focus on the deficiency onto the remembrance of the beauty of what we enjoyed. And then we can take a look at strategies to have that experience in present time. Which is again, part of one of the tools, one of the ways to do this. Uh, Maya. Yeah, I just, thank you. I have, um a lot of, um, I guess I have a lot of work yet to do on creating strategies to bring some of that into my life. I have the deficiency of, you know, there's like, say there was a hundred percent of happiness with love and sex and comedy and joy. And there was all that. And now it feels like there's practically zero. It'll get better when we're not in the pandemic. <laughs> Yeah. But now it feels practically dim because I feel very um, um, isolated. Okay. Um, so let me address that. Sure. Thank you. So again, go back in your memory and remember times that you really enjoyed with him. What was it you were doing? And really bathe in the memories. You know, it's beautiful to have memories of loved ones, you know, and whether you have photographs or videos, just memories in your mind, go back and really allow yourself. And if the, if the gremlins inside your brain keep bringing you back to, yeah, but now you're alone, but now you're alone, now he's gone. Don't give your power away to the mental gremlins. That's the fourth and final thing that I actually written down. Get to know your veils of past pain and your mental gremlins. Your veils of past pain and your mental gremlins. I'm gonna go into a little bit of a teaching point on that. All of us have veils of past pain that come down. And I love that term, um, probably because I coined it. But it, it's, it's very expressive, you know, it's like, uh, you can be in a good mood. Let's, I'm just gonna, I'm not making a political statement right now, but let's just say you're someone that's really uh, turned off by Trump. Trump really gets under your skin. So you're, uh, you're walking to your house and you're in a good mood. And on the television set, somebody's watching Trump. And immediately your mood, you see Trump doing whatever Trump is doing. Trump doing his Trump thing, and you don't even hear it. You just see it. And immediately your mood changes. Immediately you go from being happy or relaxed to Ugh. right? Well, that's a veil of past pain. Clearly, obviously, Trump didn't say anything in that moment that offended you, but just seeing him brings back your own memories of painful stuff and your body reacts. We all, and again, I'm not making a statement about Trump. I'm just using it as an example. So this, we all have this around different things. Um, it might be with a loved one. How many of you 
have been in a long-term relationship. It could be a family member or a loved one. And you're in neutral, but they look at you and they go, okay, what is it? What did I do now? What's wrong? You all experienced that? Raise your hand. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know what probably happened is you're wearing a shirt or you had a look on your face that that person's brain has a memory of another time you were wearing that shirt or you had a look on your face like that and you got into an argument or you got into a fight or you judged them or you criticized them. And the brain remembers that and brings up that memory, veil of past pain comes down and they immediately go into <laughs> reptile brain, All right? Because they have a veil of past pain. Our memories store, our brains store memories of pain at five to 30 times greater than memory of pleasure. Why? We're wired to survive. We're wired to survive. And so we have to learn what are our veils of past pain? What are the trigger words? What are the trigger experiences? Who are the trigger people? We have to know what that is because our veils of past pain come down, influence us, and then we overly react, right? In fact, all of you had asked all of you to think of a moment recently that you had been in emotional pain. So I want you to go back in your memory to whatever moment you chose. You're not going to have to share it with anybody. But whatever that pain was, is that a pain or a experience that's been similar to previous experiences, either with that person or in the past? So for example, if your emotional pain was, oh my gosh, this new relationship, it was so beautiful, but then we had a fight. Oh my God, I'm afraid it, it might not work out. Well, that's all connected to your pain from the past, right? Your fear of, oh, here I go again. This beautiful relationship is now in trouble. Oh my God, here I go again. That's all based on veils of past pain. So just take a moment. What previous experiences have you had that were painful, that were similar, or perhaps even informed you in a way that impacted and increased the emotional pain of your current situation? What past experience have you had that may have influenced or increased the current emotional pain? Radiance is writing down about being in a martyr, right? Right? You know, and the pain of when she finds herself martyring herself, not having enough boundaries. Thank you for sharing that, Radiance. And thank you. I'm noticing just now that um, uh, Radiance has put in some really nice little key points. And I will put in the four, the four things in a moment, but I'll do that while we're in um, just before breakout rooms. So who was able to find something from your past that was influencing you in present time? That's a veil of past pain. Thank you. Last piece, gremlins, and then I'm gonna actually ask a couple of my love coaches to speak so I can start creating breakout rooms. Um, we all have mental gremlins. And, you know, Candace, what she was sharing was mental gremlins. You're broken. You can't do this. That's a mental gremlin. It's not true, it's a thought. And we have to recognize when do we have thoughts that poke at us? And I really find it's valuable to see them as like little gremlins. They're like these little buggers, right? That just poke at us, right? And like they have like little pitchforks poking at us. But we can say, go away gremlins, or we can at least acknowledge, oh, that's just my gremlin poking at me, right? So, Get to know what's your veils of past pain and what are your mental gremlins. And actually, you know what I'd like to suggest is let's take a couple minutes. I'm gonna write the four um, things and start making breakout rooms. But um, 
I'd like for people, if you're willing, put into the chat box what some of your gremlins are. What are some of the mental gremlins that you have? And what are some of the veils of past pain that you have? And this is always valuable because then we can see what other people experience and go, oh my God, that's just like me. So your mental gremlins, your veils of past pain. And you don't have to do this, but I really appreciate some of you doing that. Thank you for putting these in here. I'm uh, creating some breakout rooms here. Notice how many it's about abandonment, not being good enough. So, so common. So, so painfully common. Thank you. I want to open it up before we go into our breakout rooms. Um, any other thoughts, questions, or reflections? And certainly any wisdom from our love coaches is also welcome. So any other thoughts, questions, reflections, or wisdom from our coaches? want to that are in the field. Anupraba. Um, hi, everybody. Yeah, I'm feeling really emotional today. Just um, and it's interesting, Scott, what you said, because when you originally asked for the pain and or the feelings, I kind of went back to my childhood, because it's Father's Day tomorrow, right? And, um, you know, that's a big one. And coming out of this, you know, uh, alcoholic family but you know still you love your father and um you know and feeling this really love for him and then the the fear of him and the sadness and the deep grief that you know just not ever being able to really connect deeply with him somewhere however i also was with him at the we were able to come together and feel this deep love so there was healing around that but I really, that veil of past pain now is still there with my son, who his father is left, is in Italy, doesn't make any attempt to, to see him, talk to him. And so I carry that guilt and, and somewhere, what did I do wrong? You know, and that veil of past pain, my grief, it's almost, I think, stronger than my son's actually, yeah. the way it's sounding, you know, when I speak with him. And I'm carrying this. You know, so um, I'm just, you know, feeling that. And I also love the bittersweet aspect of looking at all the, looking at the relationship and all relationships, the, the sadness around it that it ended, but yet the sweetness that was there in all of them. I love that reframing. 
And so that's, you know, what I've been doing as well. So. Thank you. Let's uh, all twinkle on a Prabha. Again, we twinkle in Love Coach Academy for those of you who are new. Thank you. Yeah, and you know, as, as she was sharing, I mean, what a, a good example of her, she feels guilty because of her thoughts about her son, which is completely rooted in how much she cares about her son. And so because she cares about her son, she feels guilty that the father that she has no control over isn't showing up for her son the way that she wants. And you see that cycle? And so the key is to drop into the beauty of your love for your son. That's like swim there, swim in the sea of your love for your son, which is underneath the mental guilt. Again, in Love Coach Academy, one of our fundamental teachings is differentiating between our thoughts, our feelings, and then what we're needing underneath it. So for Anaprabha, Oh my God, I can't believe I chose that horrible person, you know, for, for a father and he, and, and it's terrible that he doesn't even reach his son. Painful thoughts. What's she actually feeling? Sadness, frustrated, disappointed, deep disappointment and frustration that this man won't reach out to her, her, his own son. And underneath that, what are the values? Her value for connection, consideration, love, kindness, respect, and all those values are beautiful. That they're not being met is sad, frustrating, angry, but the values themselves are beautiful. And so if we dry, go down deep enough past our own deficiency story or past the uncomfortable feelings, we find these beautiful values. And it's what we call the beauty of the unmet need or the unmet value. Whatever it is we're longing for that hasn't been met, what we're longing for itself is usually precious. It's usually beautiful. So again, we pivot out of the deficiency of it not being met and into the beauty of the value itself, the value of being loved, the value of caring for your son. Does it make sense to everybody? Okay, any other thoughts, questions, or reflections before we do the breakout rooms? But Scott, I, I just want to ask, I'm curious about this question. Um, you know, and you said we always remember the, the, the negative things that happen, the painful things that happen more than the positive. Is it, do you, does the male remember more, ne is, it the, is there one male or female that would remember more negative or positive? I'm a man, so I'd say women. <laughs> I'm a woman and I say man. <laughs> there you have it. <laughs> okay. I'm just thinking man because they had to go hunt the woolly mammoth, you know, and, and so they had, but. Um, but see, women carry the emotional burden more, right? Right. Because I don't know. Yeah. No, know. It's, it's, it's interesting. I was looking at both of them, exactly what you're saying. And I was, I was curious if there's, you know, what you thought. But I, I like, can understand it. I like, I like what Deborah Haviland said. It depends on the person, regardless of gender. That's probably a pretty accurate. Yeah. So yeah. yes, yes, Deborah. Um, I think I saw Adrian's hand. Yeah, Adrian. And I think our ability, our our um, capacity to remember remember negative things so much more than positive. I think is a reflection of our our evolution to survive. You know, and we so want to survive so much of our becoming is about survival and when we remember the negative things um we're like placing like uh in our memory what could have threatened our lives because i think it's a survival mechanism so i think um females and males and all genders want to survive equally um <laughs> yeah. so i would say it's probably pretty pretty equal cool. i think it's how the primitive brain is wired <laughs> Yeah, I, exactly. And, and pathways, you know, just the connections. I think it's, I think it's, it's just wiring that's thousands of, you, how, however, hundreds of thousands of years that evolved. You know, building on what Cheryl just said, um, uh, people who study these things have determined that the further removed we are from trauma, physical trauma, the more our synapses fire in the frontal lobe but the more connected we are 
to trauma, physical trauma, the more the reptile brain tends to take over. So that has to do with your own personal life, but it also has to do with ancestral lineage. The further removed we become from an ancestral lineage of violence, the, the less hypervigilant we are. But if we've had an alcoholic father or even, you know, a parents that were in war or were in famine or were in something really hard, that again, remember, we get the genetic download of the trauma of our ancestors before we're even born. So a lot of how we react and to what degree we react is personal experience, and some of it is ancestral lineage, right? And that's all been scientifically proven. Radiance, you're up. Yes, I was just going to talk about, again, the neurochemicals that the reason why, you know, so that you don't have to go to the stove and burn your hand every single time to know that you shouldn't go to the stove and put your hand on a hot stove. So the same thing is happening in our brain with those thoughts and with those patterns. It's helping us to recognize that hurt. But what, what we're doing with empathy is shifting into a place of going from that space into the processing through the heart. Like, how do I come back in with empathy have empathy for, for that pain and transform it into my needs, my values, and my precious desires. So thank you. It's all twinkle radiance. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I want to acknowledge there's a question that Mariko asked. It's thoughts, feelings, and then needs and values are synonymous. We can call them needs, we can call them values. So it's thoughts, feelings, and then our needs or our values. It, uh, that's the answer to that question. Good question, Mariko. Okay. So can I, I, I'm still a little confused. Can I clarify that a bit? Sure. Um, so if I have a value that people should be treated fairly, that's not a need. It is, it is. It's a need, a need for fairness. It's oh, I see, okay. Yeah. So it, some you. people like to call them needs. Some people like to call them values. Some people like to call them longings of the heart. It's, it's what's the bottom line? What's the bottom line at, at the depth of what's going on? You know, I have a need for fairness. I have a need for consideration. I have a value for kindness. Okay. Yeah. And thank you for asking that, Mariko. Okay. We're going to go into breakout rooms, which uh, we have five wonderful love coaches. Um, and we're going to have five or six people in each breakout room, uh, because some of you didn't turn your cameras on. I'm not sure if you're with us or not. Um, so I'm going to kind of monitor. And if I see that there's like six people in one room and three in the other, then I'll move somebody pretty quickly. Um, our pod leaders are Timothy, Daniel, Anupaba, Adrian, and who am I forgetting? Oh, and Radiance, All right? So those are our pod leaders. Um, you're gonna have 30 minutes. Um, let's make it actually 38 minutes. We'll come back at 11.40. 38 minutes or 35 once we get started. Um, and pod leaders are gonna just facilitate conversation. And this is where each of you can bring up individual situations the way that Candace and Maya brought up some of their situations and I worked with that, our love coaches are now gonna work with you on some of your situations, all right? And I'll put into, for love coaches, I'll put into the um, Love Coach Academy Master Relationship Coach uh, thread the four, the four tools that we've talked about. I'll put it there and also put it in the chat box, okay? Um, I am going to open the breakout rooms and all of you need to click join. All of you are now hopefully seeing somewhere on your screen uh, a message asking you to join your room and please do so. Please click join. Adrian, got it. Got to get to your pod, Adrian. So for Hannah, Michelle, Haskell, Andrew, are you even listening? Are you hearing me? Hello, hello. OK. 
Okay. Okay, that's pretty good. Four, five. I'll have his four, five, four. Great. Yeah, so welcome back. Um, so what we normally do here is this is where each of our pod leaders shares with um, the group kind of the highlights, like any key moments, key teaching points, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So Radiant, since you were the first one back, I'll have you go first. Oh my gosh, it was so beautiful. Thank you. Um, Deborah was able to like really talk about the overall, like how we're coming together in medical communities with resources and deep listening. And Jay did some gorgeous light touch work. And Mary Beth is amazing. What a beautiful soul to bring into the community. Um, so thank you. I'm very grateful and, uh, and soul connected. Thank you. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, you know, that's all Twinkle Radiance and her group. All right. All right. Um, how about we hear from uh, Adrian next? Gosh, um, yeah. Another beautiful uh, breakout room. Um, a couple highlights that I took away from was the, the power of self-empathy. Um, and we talk about that a lot in Love Coach Academy. And, and I think that, you know, Scott didn't mention it by name, but when we tune into the, the beauty of our unmet need, um, and then actually Heather led me through a beautiful meditation um, that she asked me to kind of move into kindness for myself instead of the judgment of myself and judgment for other people, I just naturally went into this process of self-empathy. And so that was a really powerful exercise and then made me just able to see a little more clearly the nuance of, of self-empathy and how powerful it is um, in navigating uh, emotional pain. Another thing that came up um, was the, the tool of, and this is a subtle tool uh, and, and very powerful tool, but um, of the ability to it just accept the, the, the pain, the emotional pain, or let's say maybe even physical pain um, as it is without trying to make it different. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so often when we like change a really destructive story to a, a healthy story, an accurate story, we feel better naturally. And that's, that's, such, a, and that's such a powerful, just incredibly revolutionary um, uh, tool. And, and sometimes, um, you know, the, the, the pain is just there. And um, we just had a nice dialogue about the value and power of being able to just be with without trying to make it different. Uh, I think there's another really incredibly powerful tool of managing um, emotional pain. And that can be easier said than done sometimes. Um, like <laughs> but um, yeah, I really appreciate uh, being with uh, the people. Thank you so much. Good. Thank you. You know, I just want to riff on a moment about radical acceptance. And I mean, that's like, for me, it's the highest form of a non-denominational spiritual practice. Um, but, you know, that's what most of the great masters teach us is to be fully present to what is without the need to judge it or change it. Um, and so, yeah, radical acceptance is a powerful, powerful practice. Um, all right, Timothy, tell us about your highlights or anything you want to share. I am so alive with the beauty of the vulnerability that um, everyone in the group shared. We, uh, we probably didn't get through everybody, but we had two beautiful um, shares and we moved through the steps that Scott had outlined quite love in a, in a lovely way but I, the thing that 
really touched me is that I felt all of us are very much committed and on our paths to be more present, more awake, and um, in more surrendered to love, to source, if you will. And um, I just, I could tell that everyone through the work that we were doing together felt more integrated, more alive, more open. And I, I believe that's why I love this work so much. Thank you. Right, thank you. I will say one person in our group, her name means the, the, the aspect that is impossible to know. And that's how our session started. And I, I'm really grateful for her spiritual teacher and for the beauty of the wisdom of her name. I'm guessing that was Saraswati. Mm, close, but not close enough. No? No. It was a, a Gaya. Oh, a Gaya. Okay. Sar Saraswati's name also came into play because we talked about the beauty of staying out of story altogether and feeling the emotion without judging it as good or bad and in its most purest form and letting it move through us like a giant waterfall. So the two of their names informed our sessions um, magically. Oh, beautiful. All right. Great. Um, all right, let's hear from Anuprabha. <laughs> Um, we had a really beautiful uh, woman's circle where we were all, uh, thank you, Scott, you know, we just always, uh, you know, there's just the divineness of it. We were all able to really come together as women and each individual woman, we really went into some deep, deep somatic healing and um, really being held by the sisterhood and a, a theme of it really around women is, is really around the throat chakra and how the throat chakra is, is often one that's just like you're being choked, you know, because it's just thousands of years, it wasn't safe for us to talk really, or have a voice. And so we really worked as a group in empowering each of us um, for the, our throat chakra to open up you know, and empowering through also affirmations that we were giving to each other. We worked on a really deep level, everyone being really vulnerable. And each person got time to just, we really held each other very deeply and it created a really safe container. And um, it was just very, this womb-like experience with us. And I feel a, a rebirth kind of, there was a rebirth that happened for all of us. It was beautiful. Thank you. Like putting beautiful. us all together, yeah. <clears throat> beautiful, beautiful. And uh, going back to Hawaii, the big island, uh, Daniel. Aloha. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we had a um, we had one beautiful conversation the entire time, and most of us participated in it. Um, and it was. It was very vulnerable and um, opened up some, you know, some really painful experiences that um, that have happened. And for a, for a little bit there, it felt like I. It seemed like um, it was more than the container can handle, but everybody came together and. Uh, it was really beautiful to see like the, the, the commonalities that were shared between several of the sisters on the call and um, how they could really relate to each other. And, and just that, I think just not, not being alone in it was really healing. And we also saw how, how the, the gremlins can really take over and and really um, speed things up and have the painful stories really running the show and so the you know the tools of slowing down and and teasing apart the painful thoughts from 
the feelings and the feelings from the, the unmet needs and then swimming in the beauty of, of those needs at a time in life when they were met. And it was brought up that, um, you know, s- some of these experiences that were shared um, really had to do with, with trust and breaking trust. And um, the, the question was brought up, how, how is, like, how can I trust? This is how I interpret it. How can I trust to swim in those beautiful feelings um, when this horrible thing happened? Like, like how, how can I allow myself to, to, to swim in the, in the beauty of it? And, you know, I, uh, the beauty of the needs that weren't met, that were met at one point, and the beauty of having those needs. Um, yeah, I don't wonder if you could speak to that. You know, I think there was alluding to like maybe this was like an escape or an illusion or a bypass of some kind. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, let's twinkle Daniel and his group. And yeah, what a powerful and in, in a good question. <sighs> so as the Buddha said, always take the middle road, meaning finding that balance. Obviously, when something horrible or painful has happened, it's not about bypassing the pain. That's why one of the steps was fully feel the emotions. But also we don't want to stay in the pit of the pain too long. It's finding that balance. And obviously there are examples of where there's been spiritual bypass to not really acknowledge the pain. Obviously the examples that we all know, people that become professional victims, you know, and you meet them and they're immediately telling you the terrible thing that happened to them even 10 years ago. Um, and so it's, and here in Love Coach Academy, one of our foundational tools is empathy, you know, practicing empathy. But even within the practice of empathy, we don't want to enable ongoing victim story. So we're constantly dancing on that, what sometimes can even be a razor's edge of finding the balance of empathy and boundaries, really feeling into the discomfort, but pivoting into the beauty of the unmet need underneath that discomfort. And of course, everyone has to kind of find their own balance based on who they are, based on the situation, based on you know, the different circumstances. Does that feel like a, a, enough of an answer or a response for you, Daniel? Yeah, thank you. That helps for me clarify. I hope it does for the, the, the people in the group that had the question. Yeah, and if anybody in the group has further question, you could sort of bring up and ask it now. Um, we're almost done. We're trying to wrap up by 12 noon. I want to really uh, thank our new people that joined us. And if any of the new people who joined us are wanting to know more or get a copy of the recording, please put your email address in the chat box. Um, you can send it privately to me if you want, or just send it to the group. Um, but that's helpful, and then I'll know to put you on the list to send you the recordings. Um, Love Coach Academy is growing and expanding. We provide free webinars every day um, at 9 o'clock in the morning and 6 o'clock in the evening. And this week is Unity Week, and we're going to be a big part of Unity Week. Um, kind of our big show that we produce every week is tonight. It's called Saturday Night Live for the Global Peace Tribe. Um, tonight's show is dedicated to unity. We've got Nassim Harriman. Um, we've got Peter Russell. We've got um, some amazing speakers and some amazing musicians. Nina Gray is coming back and performing again. So that's at 7.30 p.m. tonight, and I really encourage everybody to watch. It's going to be a really wonderful show, and that's 7.30 Pacific time. <clears throat> tomorrow morning, I normally do a Sacred Sunday at 9. Tomorrow morning, I'm doing it at 10 a.m. because um, Unity is going to carry, be carrying it on their channel. There's this big, amazing 
Unity Week thing happening. Um, and I encourage everybody to check it out. Um, we're gonna have a lot of our Love Coach Academy shows on it, including tonight's broadcast. Um, and then I'm gonna be doing my Secret Sunday, but I'm doing it tomorrow at 10 a.m. Pacific time. And of course, my topic will be Unity. Um, for any more information, make sure you give me your email addresses and you can also go to lovecoachacademy.com and just click on events and that tells you about all the different shows that we've got. Uh, you can see Daniel and Timothy and Adrian and Radiance, um, uh, Anaprabha. These are all leading love coaches and they all do shows. Um, um, on, two, on Monday nights, we've got Timothy and Daniel and a wonderful woman named Heidi who do Mondays in the Ohana. They're our Hawaii group, um, they're part of our Hawaii group. We also have Mariko from Hawaii. Um, and on Tuesday mornings, how to transform triggers into treasures or from UG to WOW. And that's with Radiance and Anuprabha and Adrian and Candice. So I really wanna encourage you to come to these free online webinars play, participate, join us. And um, thank you very much for being with us today. We look forward to our next Connect with all of you. Hope to see you tonight on tonight's big show. Take care, everybody. I'm saving the chat. Here we go. All right. Good night, everybody. <laughs>